mind blowing all by itself. It just it does it itself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're right there with me though. Every time I open the hangar door to go flying, I realize that I'm one of the lucky guys doing something that I dreamt of as a kid.
Duck has always been one of my most favorite airplanes. You know, I kind of say sometimes uh, it's got a face only a mother can love, but uh, you know, it really is an extremely unique airplane. It gets a lot of attention everywhere it goes. It has the ability to land on land as well as on water. I think it's a little more at home on the water than it is on the land. got a very narrow landing gear which go up in the side of the pontoon so it tends to want to turn into the wind potentially a ground looping airplane there's a lot of area behind the landing gear and the airplane is not happy unless it's weather vanning into the wind pilot sits in the front, there's a seat in the back, but there's actually kind of a basement in the belly of the airplane. There's two little doors that slide, so in the case of picking somebody up, they could land in the water, taxi up to somebody, get it close, you know, they could swim over, climb in the airplane. There were actually two seat belts for a bench seat, so legally from an FAA point of view, you could carry four people in the airplane. I fly it in the water, fly it on the land, take it up the seaplane ramp, take it down the seaplane ramp. It's a lot of fun.
heard the dreaded words, um, uh, danger close, which meaning we're going to be employing, uh, in essence, right in the middle of their fight. Good hit, good hit. First flown in 1974, the F-16 Falcon has proven itself to be an outstanding aircraft for both air-to-air -air combat and ground attack missions. Well, our guys are getting shot up. We need those buildings dropped down. You know, we were trying to sort this out. It was very hectic, and our comfort level of where these uh, where these bombs would go um, was not completely there yet. He's clipping for me, and I'm not comfortable. In this bomb until we find out exactly what they want in the middle of a town. We're trying to piece this together, and uh, the one thing I will never forget is if you don't drop those effing bombs right now, Americans are going to die. Americans are going to die if you don't drop the bomb. And at the time, you want to absolutely make sure. I mean, the worst thing for any uh, any fighter pilot would be to drop and to to uh, hurt or kill uh, friendly people on the ground. We finally got it all together and able to put down a, a bomb and you could just hear the calm in his voice. Sniper, good effect. And it was a big sigh of relief. We landed and were met uh, by the squadron commander. Uh, to, they had already called to let us know that uh, what we did that day saved American lives. The 100th Fighter Squadron of the Alabama Air National Guard has been one of the units recently deployed to Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan. Representing the 100th Fighter Squadron at this year's Warbirds in Review is Major Ray Fowler, an F-16 flight lead who has flown four deployments to the Middle East, three to Iraq, and just this past year to Afghanistan. Ray will tell us in his own words about the F-16 and the pilots who fly in today's demanding environment.
we're here today to recognize those who are currently fighting uh, our missions, our wars, uh, and uh, protecting our freedoms. So this is a really special session for us. Uh, I will uh, hold off to uh, even uh, introduce the people who we have today because David Hartman uh, is our moderator. Some of you, uh, I see the age group out here, you've probably recognized that name. We're very fortunate to have David Hartman uh, be part of our uh, programs here. And uh, you see the logo here. Scott's miracle Grow Company uh, is our presenting sponsor for Warbirds and Reviews. So a big, big thank you to Jim Hagedorn, the Scott's miracle Grow Company. Fagan Fighters World War II Museum has uh, sponsored the coins that we'll be offering to all our veterans once the program is over uh, to say uh, thank you for your service now or your prior service. We, uh, we sincerely appreciate those uh, those airplanes that we have here and the freedoms we have to uh, be able to restore them and present them here and tell our history uh, is uh, would not happen without all the support of uh, people like Ron and Diane Fagan. And then our uh, Jelly Belly uh, sponsor that uh, gives our, uh, our volunteers uh, a, a new appreciation for a sugar attack. Uh, they, they've been dipping in the Jelly Belly. So uh, I, I would like for you to enjoy the uh, talents of Sleeping Dog Productions, Flying On Demand TV, and we are actually streaming live uh, right now. So we are not only reaching those of you who are fortunate enough to be here and experience all of this, we are reaching a worldwide audience, which I think is pretty cool that we have come that far. So again, uh, thank you to the Sleeping Dogs for uh, their talents, and they have a wonderful video that they have put together that uh, is, was taken Last fall, last summer, last fall, when our friend Ray Fowler was in Afghanistan, he uh, was uh, wishing he were here flying Mustangs uh, or, or something fun like that. But looks like he was having a pretty good time uh, flying the uh, F-16 over there with the Alabama Air National Guard that was activated. So please enjoy the presentation. And uh, thank you to all of you and uh, to you uh, Air Force personnel, the F-22 crew who made this happen this morning. Thank you. Thank you all afternoon. How fortunate are all of us Yeah, I'm watching too. How fortunate are all of us to be able to be here on this beautiful day in this beautiful place surrounded by airplanes in this gorgeous plaza dedicated to Connie Bolin and her late husband Ed. Uh, who created this program 13 years ago and who have been so significant in Warbirds for three decades. And what a privilege is it, is it for all of us to be here to honor our veterans and our men and women in uniform who continue to pr protect the freedoms of our country. We're all really privileged today. Um, thanks. So meet um, our panel. Uh, first, John Cummings. He's an Air Force major. He is the CO, the commanding officer, of the Air Force F-22 a Raptor Aerial Demonstration Team. He actually graduated from high school up the street in Appleton, coincidence, and from the University of Wisconsin um, at Madison. Earned his Air Force commission, got his wings, went to F-15s. From F-15s, he went to the F-22. He has 1,500 flight hours in the F-15 and the F-22. Uh, welcome, John Cummings, Major Cummings. Major? <laughs> I, th I just said, I know you're stealthy, but I didn't know you're that stealthy. Hey, John. Nice to meet you. Uh, have a seat. Um, next, you just heard uh, about Ray Fowler, but Jim Lawrence has had an unusual flying career. He first started with gold wings and flew as a Marine in Vietnam, A-4s and bird dogs. Then he left and went to the Navy and flew A-4s and the A-7 Corsair, then switched to the Air Force. Have you ever heard of anything like this? <laughs> no, I haven't either. Um, went to the Air Force and flew the A-10 Warthog. He served in all four wars, Vietnam, Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan, 39 years active, 7,700 hours of military flight time, and he's got 36,000 hours flying total. So Jim Lawrence? Jim Lawrence. And 
Jim. Take that next to last chair, if you would. And you just heard about Ray Fowler, but I'll fill in just a little bit um, about his guard operation and all those four deployments he's had, and recently from Afghanistan. He's also a Delta pilot with 12,000 hours, and you can find him flying every conceivable kind of warbird around the country and at air shows and museums around the country. Here is, he's Ray Fowler to us, but he's Major Fowler today. Ray? Hey man, great, how are you? Cut in the middle. And finally, Mike Wagnon, he is a warbird guy here, and he moves all these airplanes around all week of every year, but his day job, he was the electrical engineer and is in charge of electrical engineering on the F-22 at Hill Air Force Base. Here's Mike Wagden. Mike? So, Jim Lawrence, I just mentioned about your flying in Vietnam. Talk a little bit about that before we come up to the, the really modern age here about the risks of your A4 flying and your, and your bird dog flying. Well, the technology, obviously, with this F-22 sitting here was dramatically different from what we had in Vietnam in the A4, and especially in the bird dog. All we had at the time was basically a map, so you learned to read the map very, very well. The uh, Marine squadrons, I was with VMA-211 based in Chulai, we were moved off of the uh, carriers so that our uh, reaction time for the close air support to the Marine grunts and the Army grunts uh, would be much more. Uh, I flew uh, the A-4 for quite a while, and then I was asked to volunteer to go fly as a bird dog fac with uh, VMO-6, and I was, uh, my call sign was fingerprint 401 in the, uh, in the 01. So and it was... Uh, Flying the bird dog was actually more rewarding to me personally, and I was 21 years old, so I was dumber than a box of rocks, but working with the grunts on a daily basis and seeing the, the impact that you made on saving our Marines and saving our soldiers uh, was pretty dramatic. So you moved to Navy and flew what, the Corsair? Yes, sir, I flew the, uh, the A-7 Corsair, uh, deployed on the uh, Forrestal and the Eisenhower. So describe, what, what's the difference between carrier launch and trap compared to landing out here on a runway? Well, one thing, that runway is not moving. <laughs> and the, uh, the carrier can be, uh, be pretty interesting. The um, worst deck I ever landed on was pitching 26 feet. And uh, that can be rather sporting. Uh, taking off out of here, you know, you push the power up and you launch. And with a uh, catapult shot, you go from, typically, in the A-7, loaded, we would go from zero to about 175 in 1.9 seconds. So it was, a, it was a pretty good catch shot. And, of course, coming into land, uh, you had about a 24-inch window as you came across the, um, the back of the ship. So it was, uh, it was fun. I loved it. I'd be doing it again today if they'd let me. <laughs> Uh, move on to the Air Force, you, Mr. Every United States Armed Force, uh, flying the Warthog in Bosnia. Yes, sir, you ought to see my closet. It looks like a war surplus store. But uh, I was in the Navy, and I had been selected for commander and all this other stuff, and they came in and said, uh, well, you guys aren't going to be flying anymore. And I had a buddy of mine that was the squadron commander of an A-10 unit, and uh, I called Pig Dog and said, hey, you know, what do you think? And he said, man, I'd love to have you. I had had a really unique experience. I got to go to Top Gun School, or Air Force Fighter Weapons School, uh, as a naval aviator, uh, which was kind of interesting. That's kind of a funny story. But, um, and at the time, I had a uh, two-star general who happened to be one of my best friends, who was the uh, head of the Air National Guard, and I called Phil up and told him what I wanted to do, and, and this is a true story, as God is my witness. I was out of the Navy and in the Air Force in a day and a half. <laughs> so that, what was your first flight, first flights over Bosnia in the A-10? Uh, in Bosnia, we were deployed initially uh, during Operation Deny Flight, and uh, we flew patrols over Bosnia, 
uh, keeping the you know the Serb uh, forces on the ground, uh, their air force and everything. We kept them uh, down, and then in August of '95, uh, the Serbs shelled the um, marketplace in Sarajevo and killed a bunch of women and children. And then NATO finally got the guts to do something about it, and uh, we launched. Uh, I led the first strike of A-10s that morning, August 25th, and uh, we then changed to deliberate force. And I honestly didn't think that we were going to be able to go in and, and hit these guys. Took off at two o'clock in the morning. We found our tankers, which for the A-10 we didn't have any air-to-air -air radar, like you know, Ray's uh, bird and John's bird. So finding our tankers was kind of an interesting thing in the pitch black night, but we did. And then we went into an orbit off the uh, coast of uh, Bosnia. And about that time, sun came up, Magic, which was the AWACS aircraft, I was Mako 27. And they called me and said, Mako 27, go green, which meant go secure radio and all that other good stuff. So I did, and they came up and said, your weapon's free. And I went, holy crap. Uh, we're really going to do this. And so I called the strike package over to, uh, to the radio frequency we needed to be on. And I released them and I said, uh, your cleared weapon's free. You know, God be with us. And off we went. Now, how much, how much anti-aircraft, if any, how much ground fire? What, what were the risks in the way you were flying that, that mission and those missions? The one particular mission, this was the first morning, our target was the largest armor repair facility in all of the Balkans. Um, and it was a, uh, in a town called Hadici, just outside of Sarajevo. My wingman, Dan Peabody, was an attorney, so we called him counselor. And uh, counselor and I rolled in and as I rolled in on the target, uh, Dan, who had never seen uh, any combat experience at all, he uh, was a um, guard baby his whole life, and uh, all of a sudden he starts yelling at me, and I've rolled in and I've locked up my target that I'm supposed to shoot with a Maverick missile, and just as I'm squeezing the trigger, Dan starts yelling at me, Nomad, Nomad, Sam, break, Sam, Sam. Well, one of the things that you do if you're going to direct the guys, you tell him which way to break. But Dan was so excited at seeing a real, no kidding, surface-to-air missile coming up that he said everything but which way to break. So it was one of those instantaneous decisions. You know, I just said, okay, I'm going left, and I broke really hard left. And I looked over my shoulder, and I picked up the Sam coming up. And one of the things that you want to do is to defeat it is you want to try and make the angles so great that the missile can't, the gimbal, you know, it'll, it can't hack the turn. So anyway, I was able to, and I put flares out. I wasn't getting anything to let me know that it was a radar missile. So I knew it was a heat seeker and started putting out flares, defeated this missile. And about that time, Dan called me and he said, Nomad, Nomad, two Sams right, five o'clock, break right, break right. And so I broke right into him, picked up those two, defeated those two missiles. And then he called me and he said, Nomad, break left, Sam coming up, 8 o'clock. So I broke back left, defeated that one. And then the fifth one came up, and I'm taking it on. And all of a sudden, these tennis ball-sized tracers are going by my airplane. <laughs> and there's flak going off, and I thought, damn, this is really serious. And uh, anyway, I was able to defeat that uh, fifth one. Well, the British uh, on Mount Igman were able to fire artillery, uh, anti-aircraft, uh, on those anti-aircraft sites, and they were able to knock out three of them. But the one that was away out of their range was just hammering away at me, and about that time, the sixth SAM came up, and I, was, I went over it inverted and was able to defeat it. And then the gun and I were just uh, having, it was like the gunfight at the OK Corral. Um, Literally, I had tracers going by my canopy, and I said, well, you know, if I'm going down, I'm going to take somebody with me, and I flipped my gun on. There's a 30-millimeter shell. How the A-10 carries 1,142 of these and fires 70 a second. Well, well, That'll hurt you. Right. So anyway, I took on this sight. It was a 37-millimeter, and... Um, I started firing at about 9,000 foot slant range 
started hitting him, got a secondary explosion, and then broke out of there. In the meantime, Dan had called me, Nomad, Nomad, I'm hit, because Dan had rolled in to try and uh, help me get some of the pressure off of me. And so now I'm contending with defeating these missiles and this, these um, anti-aircraft sites, and now I've got a wingman that's been hit. And I knew that his wife was going to kill me because they were expecting triplets the next month. And if anything happened to Dan, I was a dead man. So anyway, I told Dan to break out and head for feet wet. And uh, I was able to get out of there, finally joined on him, looked at his airplane. What had happened was that we had a um, bad batch of ammo in his airplane. And it had internally exploded. And Dan, there was a big boom. And... His airplane shook, so he thought he had been hit. But anyway, I joined on him, and we went to the tanker. Uh, I told Magic, the AWACS, that we were desperate for fuel, and the tanker guys actually were magnificent. They rolled out right in front of us about a quarter of a mile, and then we, we went home. So that was the first morning, first mission. Uh, how did it go after that? How long were you continued to fly these missions? We were over there for, uh, and this is right after uh, O'Grady got shot down. Right. We were activated and sent over to Aviano, Italy. Uh, we were there for another five months. Uh, we continued combat operations uh, throughout September and the end of October. And then we actually escorted the Serb forces out of Bosnia. You know, lately we're hearing and reading in the papers that the Pentagon, I guess the Pentagon wants to cancel the A-10 and get rid of the A-10 Warthog? What's your thought about that? They're idiots. Why? Uh, the A-10 is an incredibly unique airplane. It does so many missions well. Uh, uh, Sandy mission, which is escorting the rescue helicopters. Uh, C-130, but you talk to any grunt on the ground, Marine, Army, or otherwise, and the one airplane that they want to be there is the A-10. It's got the staying power, we've got the loiter time, and we certainly can carry the ordnance. Uh, we can't get there as fast as these guys can, and not that their airplanes are not capable, because they certainly are. The A-10 is just a different animal. But to get rid of the A-10 uh, is a huge mistake, big mistake. Well, Ray, let's move up to F-16. How long have you been flying the F-16? Uh, 15 years now. And uh, so I started uh, back in uh, to 2000 flying the airplane. So uh, I've been in the, as a guard baby, started with Air National Guard, and uh, happy to still be flying it today. Tell us about the airplane and what it will do and what it's designed to do, what its missions are. Well, everyone obviously knows about the F-16. It's still a very popular airplane, built in the early 70s. Uh, the airframe is pretty much the same as it uh, was when it was designed in 1974 when it first flew. Uh, however, it's been highly modified now, so we have a lot more capability in the airplane. It was really designed as a, a day air-to-air -air fighter. Uh, really, it's now multi-role. It's uh, day and night. And uh, fortunately for us, they have upgraded uh, the weaponry, the avionics, and uh, really made it a very capable airplane for what we use it for. Uh, but obviously, it's... Uh, uh, you look at the technology and what the F-16 can do, uh, this thing is quantum leap uh, more in, in uh, technology. So, uh, you know, this is the future. You know, the F-16, I wouldn't say is the past and in the role that we're in right now, particularly in Afghanistan and where we're flying, where we really are not threatened from the, uh, the double-digit SAM systems and some of the more uh, technological uh, surfaced air missiles that can actually knock us out of the sky. Same with the A-10. You know, it, can't, it is an amazing airplane, and like he's saying, in our role today for close air support, both airplanes are great. It's just not survivable throughout the entire world in the theaters that we can go fight anywhere in the world. So uh, this is the future. Again, the F-16, I think on day three or four after this guy knocks everything out that uh, can mess with us, then we can do good work. But uh, it is an amazing airplane still today for what it does. It's, uh, it's a great airplane. What were your Iraq missions? You had four deployments to Iraq. Uh, we went over, we were deployed as uh, night one of the uh, second Gulf War, so uh, I had a, a nice seat to uh, watch all the cruise missiles hitting downtown Baghdad for that. Um, but our role over there was really to support uh, the guys on the ground, the uh, special forces guys that were in there that were, were basically there to, uh, you know, to uh, push out the, the current regime. So we, we've had multiple trips over there to really install the new government and um, Again, it, the, you know, we've been there a decade before even that war started as a part of the Northern Southern Watch 
And, uh, you know, again, in that part of the world, I think we're going to be there for some time. Now, what about Afghanistan? You've just come back recently from Afghanistan. What were you doing? Uh, much of the same thing. So we were, uh, that was our second, our unit's second presidential activation. So we were sent over there for six months. And it's really the first time that the, an Air Guard unit has been sent for six months with no swap out. So typically with the Guard, they will take multiple units and they will allow for a swap out. Uh, they told us, congratulations, you're going for the entire six months uh, with no swap outs. And uh, it really was not a, uh, any kind of voluntary uh, activation from our end. So last year, whenever I was actually watching these great programs on the Internet, uh, I was over there stewing, wishing I was here instead of over there. But uh, we were doing close air support, so uh, all the coalition uh, people on the ground, uh, unfortunately, you, you, know, we, you don't hear about it as much, but it's happening daily, and I guarantee it's happening over there now with the drawdown. Uh, we still have uh, American forces, coalition forces outside the wire, outside of these bases that are out there, and, and they need support. They need, uh, they need airplanes overhead, and um, that's what we were there to do. And of all my deployments, that one, uh, bar none, was the, uh, the most interesting one and the most employments that we did. So just between my flight alone, we, you know, me and my wingmen were over 40 combat employments. You know, we got to shoot the gun multiple times, which is always a, a hoot in combat uh, as well. Uh, and just to be a part of that, it was, uh, it was an amazing experience. But uh, we had several missions to where, you know, it, it made the difference on guys getting back to their families, and uh, that's pretty gratifying. How much, uh, how much latitude did you have in wanting to either, you know, shoot rockets, guns, drop bombs, and to what extent did KAOC, like in Qatar and so forth, control what you were able to do and why? Well, we, we say that we need to add a second seat to the F-16 so we can carry the attorney with us, so we can pass the documents back and forth to make sure that you're legal before you push that button. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it is part of being a fighter pilot is just making decisions, uh, but you have to be able to back those decisions up. But uh, the rules are very specific over there now. I mean, obviously in that part of the world, you can't win the hearts and minds if you're hurting people that don't need to be hurt. So uh, very restrictive on what we could do. Um, however, when, you know, uh, it got into some of these life or death situations with guys on the grounds where they had to have uh, people drop bombs, um, fortunately for us, I mean, everything's precision now. So we did drop incredibly close to forces, which uh, when you push that button, you're, you're really hoping that the engineers got it right and that bomb goes where it's supposed to go because nobody wants to find out that they hurt somebody that wasn't supposed to be uh, when you get back. But, uh, yeah, the rules are very, very specific and uh, very restrictive. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we would, you know, shoot the gun because it was sometimes uh, it would just take too long to get through the approval process to drop, uh, you know, a higher class, you know, 500 pound bomb. John, up to your airplane. We've just heard him laud your airplane. Tell us about the Raptor. What's it designed to do? What does it do? What are your missions? Well, the F-22's mission is air dominance. So it was, uh, it was originally designed to replace the F-15 back in the 1980s to be our, our premier air-to-air -air fighter. Uh, it is a, as a fifth generation fighter, we talk about four specific things, so, it, and I'll explain all of them, but stealth, super cruise, integrated avionics, and then the superior maneuverability. So for the stealth, you can see the airplane, uh, everything on it was designed with stealth in mind. So the, the idea is to be able to engage the enemy long before, and kill them long before they see you. Uh, super cruise gives us the ability to gain and sustain supersonic speeds without afterburner. The engines are designed around it. They're optimized for fuel efficiency at Mach 1.5. It just gives us the ability to cover a lot more battle space and operate a lot farther apart from what we would traditionally employ as, uh, as two ships in a close visual formation. Uh, the advanced integrated avionics piece is, uh, is important as well. It allows us to uh, to fight far outnumbered than what uh, other folks would, and the reason it, it does that is because it combines information from all the sensors on the airplane and it builds track files and it does so automatically. It, if the radar sees uh, an airplane, it'll go out and test some other sensors to find out more about that airplane. And as the jet starts to build tracks, we look at a God's eye view of the battle space as opposed to historically where you have a radar display over here, maybe radar warning over here, and, you'd have, and, you're, and maybe a tactical data link. And you're, you're building those pieces, putting those all together in your own brain to build the battle space picture. And the Raptor does that for you and that's a, a, a force multiplier for sure. And then finally, the maneuverability of the airplane. Uh, it's, got, uh, it's the only operational uh, jet fighter that we have in the Air Force or in the U.S. Uh, military right now with thrust vectoring engines. And it's a completely fly-by-wire uh, flight control system with, 
with very large flight control services that just give the ability to maneuver the airplane the ability to maneuver in ways that uh, that seem to defy physics. To what extent are you, you say it's all fly by wire? Um, have you seen or experienced anything where the where the fly by wire the electronics went awry and forced you to have to make decisions? that you would not normally have to make if everything's working right? You know, there's no manual backup at all. So the, the stick, to pull the stick back, it takes 43 pounds. Why? I guess because the engineers thought so. And all that force just sends an electrical signal to the flight controls that says, I want to pitch up. So it's, uh, there's three different computers. They're all making decisions. They're, vote, they're voting on what one another thinks. But uh, without those computers, the airplane just wouldn't be flying. So there'd be one way uh, you'd be flying that silk parachute down to the ground if, uh, if anything happened there. So um, as far as the way the system works, though, it's pretty spectacular. The, the flight control laws that, uh, that the jet is designed around um, know about the airflow, speeds, all that goes into the computers, and they help make their decisions. So for normal level crews, if I move the stick to the side, I get ailerons deflecting. But as I start to get higher in alpha, even maneuvering post-stall, all bets are off. So the jet might know that one rudder is completely washed out. So to save uh, hydraulic forces, it's only going to move one. The one that it knows is, uh, is actually going to see the forces in the windstream. So it can yaw the airplane using differential movements of the stabs. It's just, it's just really impressive. The, um, it, is all that electronics as, as fabulous as you describe, but does it also require so much concentration that you can be thrown off broader picture challenges in any way? You know, the engineers did a really nice job. When we, uh, as part of the, um, being on the demonstration team, I actually go and get to talk to some of those folks that worked on the, the flight control system of the airplane, um, and, uh, and we practiced some, some emergency situations that, would, that could possibly get us in trouble close to the ground doing the demo. And uh, in doing so, I've been able to talk to those folks, and sometimes we give them a hard time. The, uh, you know, the airplane has the gun, it's on one side, as you can all see, there's a rectangular door over the, the uh, right wing root up there. Um, and it, when you take off, the airplane just has this ever so slight roll to the right, and it's because the gun is over there. So that the, they want the airplane to have this natural feel to it that, uh, that it wouldn't have if they didn't do such a good job with designing the flight control. So you'd be hard pressed to fly something with a manual flight control system and go fly this airplane and know that it's different. Well, Mike, you started smiling when he started talking about the electrical system. How much can you tell us about the electrical system on the airplane? Well, um, yeah, really close, really close. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, the electrical system on this aircraft, um, when we was first starting to uh, design it, uh, it took a lot of the new technology, plus we was also pushing uh, the envelope at the time of what the technology was out there. And to get all the different systems and the different companies that was developing these systems uh, to talk together under the same language was one of the biggest challenges that we had. Um, to be able to integrate it and uh, set up the uh, electronics so that way the pilot didn't have to worry about it. Uh, a lot of the ideas here was to uh, take a lot of the work that the pilot has to do to maintain the airplane, uh, take that away from him and let the electronics handle that part so that way he can concentrate on his mission. And uh, that was the whole idea about the Raptor was to make it much easier for the pilot to do what he has to do to be able to uh, accomplish his mission. So how satisfied are you and you, John, that you've accomplished that with this airplane? I'm very pleased with it. Uh, I'm very happy because <laughs> since I worked on it, yeah, I'm happy. Uh, uh, we were tied in with a lot of electronics, the structures, and, and, uh, and the LO and everything about the aircraft and what we was doing. Uh, and there were so many different groups within, um, within Lockheed and, and the other uh, uh, businesses that was working with us to try. And just as soon as we set up one side of the uh, uh, electronics and it was working fine then when we go to integrate something else then we'd have to try and and it, it's a lot of give and take just like uh, in in uh, designing the aircraft uh, you know you've got your your uh, your aerodynamic people that says no you can't put that there because it's going to interfere with the aircraft uh, and then uh, you've got your uh, LO people that says no because you know that's going to cause other kinds of problems so it was a, a lot of give and take until we actually came up with the configuration we have now, but we're very pleased with uh, the aircraft. John, you mentioned the gun on the right side. 
Uh, what are the weapons? What are there other weapons besides the gun? Absolutely. Being the uh, the air-to-air -air fighter that it is, it was designed to carry uh, six uh, AMRAMs, which is the AIM-120. It's our medium-range radar-guided air-to-air missile. So it can carry six of those as well as two AIM-9s, and uh, that would be an all-air-to-air -air configuration. You can give two of those AMRAMs away and carry a 1,000-pound bomb or a, a rack of four uh, small-diameter bombs, the GBU-39. So it can carry up to uh, eight of those, if, if we so choose, or two 1,000-pound bombs, but in the all-air-to-air -air loadout, it's eight missiles in the gun. So it is a genuine fighter bomber, right? Well, it, 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 we have a, uh, we would call it an air-to-air -air fighter with a, a ground uh, attack capability. So um, we, uh, unlike um, airplanes that do close air support um, that can actually look at ground-moving targets or get talk-ons, anything like that, uh, I don't have the ability to look and see with a targeting pod what I'm actually uh, dropping on the ground. I, I only drop coordinate-seeking GPS-guided weapons. Have you, uh, Ray, have you ever dog fought, or whatever the term is, with, uh, with a F-22? Uh, yes, we have. In fact, I, uh, last month we went out to Nellis, and uh, we were dedicated support for the weapons school for the guys that were going through uh, the weapons school at Nellis uh, in the F-22. So uh, it's fun uh, to go do that, just to see this airplane and what it can do. Uh, it's also fun to hear the guys when they talk about how they shot a Raptor and all that, but... We, we all know that if that happened, it's, it's, it's basically, you know, it's a 20 to 1 type thing. And it's, this airplane is amazing. So when you start talking about the LO, low observation, we just don't see it on the radar. And, and uh, that's the good thing. I'm glad we own them. And, uh, and that's the whole intent that uh, when, when we go to war against someone else, they won't see it either. And uh, they'll come through and, and just basically mow down all the people that, uh, that don't need to be flying. But uh, it is amazing to dogfight, to see. And... You know, we cannot, um, you know, several of the missions that we go out and go fly with the airplane, uh, it's, uh, again, I can't tell you how amazing it is to watch the airplane in the air and to see what uh, the capability is over the F-16. Ray, did you have other tape? Did you bring other tape from your Afghanistan missions, or was that all shown earlier? Well, whatever the Air Force had, we provided to them, and that was, uh, that's pretty much what we had for that. Right. Um, Mike, back, uh, back to you. When you think about this technology, when did you start designing or being part of the design team with electrical systems on airplanes? About 15 years ago uh, is when I got, got involved with the Raptor. And um, I actually got involved with the structures first and then got tied in as, as we started developing and started modifying and doing more stuff to the Raptor. Uh, I'm actually doing more in structures and, and other parts of the aircraft. I am electrical anymore, right. but um, uh, at the time that I got involved, uh, again, we was trying to get everything working together and, and talking in the same language, also to get it set up to where we can give more information to the pilot uh, so that way he understands what, what's going on. Jim, we started with the bird dog, and now we're talking about the raptor and what it's capable of doing. I mean, this is almost a history in the last 40 years of military aviation from one extreme to another. Right. The aircraft that I flew, the F.A. Crusader and the A-4 Skyhawk and A-7 Corsair and, of course, the Bird Dog, I mean, we couldn't even spell GPS. So, I mean, it, you know, was non-existent. So the technology that, that Ray sees and the technology that John sees is just fantastic. So what were you flying in, uh, in Afghanistan? Because you weren't on active duty, were you? No, sir. I volunteered. I was asked to volunteer to go fly with the, um, basically, Department of Defense, uh, 101st Airborne is who I was attached to. And I volunteered to go fly MC-12s, which are King Air 350s, had all the super secret stuff in the back that, uh, that we used and worked directly with our ground troops over there. So it was, it was a very rewarding uh, John, you, you talked about, well, he just talked about secret stuff on the back of the airplane. How much secret stuff is there on the Raptor that you can't talk about? <laughs> that's, that's one of the popular que air show questions. Tell me a secret that you can't tell anybody else. Um, <laughs> right, right. But, uh, you know, the, the Raptor, it's, it's interesting. You see there's a few gentlemen running around here with, uh, with machine guns, but... Um, we started stealth technology with the F-117. Even the SR-71 had some, uh, some uh, low observable features to it. We moved on to the B-2, which was the computer-aided stealth generation where you could start to get smooth surfaces. And, uh, and now, now we have the Raptor and the, uh, and the F-35. 
and uh, of course those are built on all the lessons that we've learned that of course the secrets that we don't want to get out so um, you know we're worried about the airplane because it's a it's a, a valuable asset just to have in general but so much of what we've learned that uh, you know technology wins wars and so that's what we always try to protect which is why I will say yes yeah yeah <laughs> next question yeah. Um, F-35 you just mentioned, to what extent does the F-35 build on this technology, or to what extent will the F-35 have a different mission? That's another popular question. So the F-35 is really designed to complement the F-15. The, the intention... F-15? Uh, I'm sorry, the F-22. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, you know, where I mentioned that this is primarily an air-to-air -air fighter that has an air-to-ground capability, you can reverse that for the F-35. So it's, it's designed to be a joint uh, fighter. It's designed to, to meet a lot of uh, a multi-role fighter, a lot of different uh, mission sets in one airplane. I'm not going to tell you if that was a good idea or not, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, we tried to win, uh, I think, the war of numbers, meaning uh, the cheaper, the more of something you make, the cheaper it gets. So that, that I think, was the intention. Uh, who's to say where we are today? But I will say, knowing a little bit about the airplane, that, it, that uh, you know, the Raptor had growing pains that the F-35 is going through now. There's certainly way more eyes on the F-35 based on the size of the program and the, the, the media that we have today surrounding it. But uh, if, it, uh, if it one day d does what it's designed to do, then it's going to be a heck of an airplane as well. Well, Jim, you started. Yeah, one thing that is amazing with the technology that John and Ray see, the airplanes that I flew, we had to get behind them. We had to dogfight them and get behind them. They were all rear aspect. And now these guys have the BVR capability, which is fantastic. Which means? Uh, beyond visual range. I mean, they can get a lock in the guy. They don't even have to see him and uh, don't have to positive ID, visual ID. And uh, they can knock him out of the sky, which is just absolutely wonderful. Right. But the one thing is, you know, the bad guys have got some pretty good stuff, too. So, Mike, did you start to speak? Yeah, uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, the Raptor was designed for is that, you know, the F-16 and the fighter pilots and everything were trained there was to fight and attack. Uh, the Raptor is more of finding its target, getting within range, locking on, firing, and then getting out of there instead of actually attacking. You're trying to stay away from the one-on-one -on -one more than you're trying to... Uh, go in and it's not always just visual because you can do it with the GPS. Right. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, uh, anybody got a question for these guys? A hand raise? Yes sir, stand and yell please. We built 195 of them, and so the, uh, some of the more recent ones that are off the assembly line we have here, uh, it is no longer in production. 2012, I think, is when the last one was uh, rolled off the uh, assembly line, and we have uh, tail 192, so th third uh, or fourth from the, uh, the last is uh, on display in Boeing Plaza, and we'll be flying that one this afternoon. So, questions? Yes, sir, down here in yes, the front. Yes, sir, right here. Stand, please. In addition to our own military, we have some very close allies, particularly in the Middle East. I wondered uh, what sorts of assets the Israelis have and how likely they are to be able to get into Iranian airspace when and if they need to, given the fact that what we hear is that uh, those people over there are getting the latest Russian stuff. Good question. Anybody want it? <laughs> I'm still wearing the green suit, so I guess I'll answer that question. So the um, it's uh, so we like to study, and uh, it's it's very easy to to fight uh, wars where there's uh, red and blue, as we call it. So blue being good, and red being bad, and then everything in between is gray. So um, you know the F-30. Uh, well, as Israel is going to get the F-35. Um, and uh, what what the other uh, as as to other threat nations, the things that they have. Um, those are things that, uh, you know, that we have folks that in the intelligence community that, that follow all that. And, uh, and it's just not uh, to, to talk to those kind of things here would, in the specific details, it's just not uh, what we'd get into. I got one here, Dave. Gentlemen, you haven't talked about JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munitions with the Ring Laser Gyro. 
Well, I'm one of the guys that brought the ring laser gyro out of the tool and die stage and brought it into production. And you know what amazing weapon that is. Yes, and I will tell you it is an amazing weapon. So if you were part of that, uh, boy, uh, I love it. Uh, you know, we, we joke and we say it's 06 bombing, meaning and you can let any colonel go fly the airplane, he can hit his target. So uh, it is amazing. Um, I dropped over 20 of them with uh, the trip we, that we were just on. So, again, like he's saying, uh, when we, if we can find the target, um, we can generate coordinates and we can hit that target and kill it. And uh, the JDAM is an amazing, absolutely amazing uh, piece of technology. Uh, you basically just type in a coordinate. You can type in an impact angle. You can type in an azimuth where you want it to go. If it's a revetted structure, you can actually have that weapon go into that structure in, in any angle. Uh, and, but a, a lot of things that with weapons that we've dropped in the past, like the uh, uh, laser-guided bombs, you know, we had to drop those on a specific axis, and we wanted them to come off within a basket. Uh, and there were all kinds of different uh, things that could uh, foil those. Uh, just a single cloud getting in the weapon, you could lose your target, the moving target. Uh, so we do have the laser uh, JDAMs as well. So we, we actually drop laser JDAMs over there. And again, um, when I went over for the first trip to Iraq, we could actually put in uh, eight digits into that. So we figured out the math. It was really could be about a six foot. So we're talking six foot difference in that. And uh, when you do your tape review, you would actually see that bomb hit somewhere within that six foot range. You know, now we have a 10, ten digit. Uh, we put it in there. So again, if you could generate the coordinates to that circle right there for the Scots logo and... Uh, and from uh, 35,000 feet, you could drop a bomb and run away bravely. And that's one thing we, we do pretty well that the A-10 can't do is run away bravely. Uh, and it will hit uh, right in the middle of this, uh, right in the middle of this spot here. And it, it just does not miss. And, and again, of all the ones we dropped uh, over in Afghanistan, we didn't have a single malfunction at all. They all found their targets, which is amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much for what you've done. Right here, Dave. He asked the only uh, problem they had with the Raptor was in the oxygen system. Can you report on that? Sure thing. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've learned designing uh, this airplane is we used to, historically, the military played a very large part in uh, designing uh, components and subcomponents by a uh, mill spec and saying, handing the blueprint to a company and say, build this. And uh, one thing that we did with the Raptor was, uh, to no fault of anybody, is just we made those requirements a lot more liberal. So um, we learned a lot of lessons with the troubleshooting the oxygen system on the F-22 and how requirements are generated, especially when you have systems that integrate uh, um, with, uh, with other suppliers. So, you know, it's a Lockheed airplane, but Boeing owns the electric, a lot of the subsystems, who then contracts to Honeywell, who makes the OBOX, who other companies make components that go in it. So it's, uh, I mean, it's made all over the country and probably in all 50 states to make it a good deal for Congress. So um, the... Uh, there were just, uh, there's just some subtle differences in how we designed the life support system on this airplane. We didn't really fix anything. We just understood how the, uh, um, some of the restrictions that were put on uh, different components and how the air was being delivered to the pilots. And we also learned stuff about how our uh, life support equipment and the gear, that, the survival gear that we wear um, was, uh, was affecting all of that. So um, we, uh, like I said, we increased our understanding significantly. We realized, I think, in the Air Force that one of our core competencies used to be aerospace. And, and, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you wanted to know something about flying at high altitudes and or going into space, you, you went to see the United States Air Force. And I think we've, uh, we've farmed a lot of those things out to uh, that knowledge base out to, uh, um, to either uh, academic institutions or, or suppliers. So. Mike? Did you want to add anything to that, Mike? No? no I okay. Think, That's I, I fine. think he, he explained it very well. <laughs> Good. Yes, sir. Uh, Major, could you talk about the mission uh, reliability and capability rates of the F-22? We've heard there's, uh, they're not as, a, not as useful because of that. 
You know, I don't know the exact numbers, but what I will tell you is an honest answer is, uh, so I used to fly the F-15C before this, and I remember we'd go out in the morning, and the, the planned mission would be, um, would be 12 airplanes going out to fly, either all together or separate different missions. And if you, uh, in an aging fleet, if you were to get uh, eight or even uh, nine of those jets out and airborne, that was a pretty good day. And, uh, and I, I will knock on wood on this chair, but I, the, it's a, I can't tell you that many times where I've gone out thinking I was going to fly the Raptor and I went back inside. So it, uh, it does very, very well. It does exceptionally well. I would have to ask one of my uh, experts in black in uh, the mechanics on that, but I, I couldn't tell you. The, it, it's, it's actually an exceptionally maintainable airplane. The, the one thing about the airplane that's different from every, everything else, though, is the, uh, is the LO, is, uh, um, as previously alluded to. So the entire airplane is covered in uh, radar absorbent material, and if you want to get at a certain component, sometimes it involves a hammer and a chisel to, to chip that stuff away, take the panel off, fix what you need to fix, put it back on, and then it goes into a, you know, a LO restore and a cure for that. And so a lot of the panels that you can see on the airplane, particularly in the nose of the airplane, are uh, easy access panels. So um, we lose a little bit. We've given a little bit away in the, in the stealthiness of the airplane for maintainability. So it's, it's always a compromise. Yeah, um, that's one thing that uh, we constantly uh, work on is because um, since the whole aircraft is covered in LO material, um, it takes quite a bit to be able to break into the aircraft uh, to get to a very simple fix that normally it takes just a, a screwdriver to, and take a panel off. Well, we break into the seams so that way when we take the panel off, then when we put it back on, then we have to go back and, like he's saying, restore the coatings to the, to the previous stealth uh, level that it has. And that's, that's usually where we have a lot of our labor and maintenance uh, is tied in with the uh, coatings that's on the aircraft. Sir. Uh Major Fowler and, and Mr. Lawrence, thank you for your service. Could you two speak of your, your current day flying warbirds as compared to the active duty aircraft that you flew at the appropriate times? That's part one. And, and part two, could you all also speak to the wearing of mustaches in a combat area? <laughs> yes. Robert Dixon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they own the Swamp Fox. And uh, yes, I, to speak to the modern airplanes versus the warbirds, um, before I ever went in the military, I was kind of a military wannabe, so I was very fortunate to get to fly a lot of neat airplanes. I was flying the P-51 before I actually went into pilot training for the Air Force as a lieutenant. And uh, again, you look at the a P-51 out there, which is you know probably one of the most beautiful airplanes I think I've still ever seen. It's just got the great lines, and it's a great airplane. So to, to look at their mission and what they did for us and for our freedoms versus the modern day airplanes, um, it is, it's night and day, so at least back in those days, it was really more of the air crew. I mean, they, they made the decisions. Their airplanes did not keep them out of trouble. Uh, our airplanes, for the most part, keep us out of trouble um, and don't let us do really dumb things. Uh, he, he alluded to the fly-by-wire, the F-16, same fly-by-wire, so uh, you're really a voting member. You tell the airplane what you want to do, and the airplane can say, you really don't want to do that, so it'll take it away from you. Uh, and so really, we could solo you in an F-16 probably in a third of the time, if not, you know, a lot quicker than we could in any kind of World War II airplane. So obviously the, uh, uh, the controls are, uh, are really a lot different in that regard, but the F-16 is much easier to fly. But again, that's the mission is not the flying. So the airmanship is basically secondary to the mission, and that's accomplishing what we're there to do. And then, uh, you know, shoot down airplanes, drop bombs on bad people. So I'll let, uh, let Jim give you his response. Well, the airplanes I flew, have, they were all fly-by-wire also, and the cables were about that big around. <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, that was pretty much the fly-by-wire, you know, that I had. Uh, I'm currently flying a T-6. I'm, Ray is one of my heroes. Uh, he gets to fly all the World War II airplanes that I salivate over. And uh, thanks to Connie uh, and Melissa and Ray, I got my first ride in a P-51 which was just fantastic, but I agree with Ray, the, uh, the warbirds of yesteryear that the world's greatest generation uh, provided and what those guys flew compared to what we've flown, and especially these guys have flown, uh, the difference is night and day, but it still hasn't taken the pilot, you know, this UAV thing is, in my opinion, is starting to get out of hand because in a combat situation, 
uh, you need a pilot sitting in there, not some guy sitting sipping coffee, not to take anything away from the UAV guys, but you need a pilot sitting in the seat that can make the decision on the scene at the moment. So anyway, that was it. I might add to part of the question you asked of, of, of Ray about mustaches. At 10 o'clock on uh, Saturday morning, uh, Christina Oles will be here. Her late dad, of course, Robin Oles, who had the most famous mustache in Vietnam. Uh, so come visit us on Saturday morning and hear a lot about Ray Oles. Uh, Robin Oles, excuse me, from his daughter who uh, completed writing his memoirs. Sir. Uh, just a question. As an F-22 pilot, is there an aircraft or a weapon system that you fear or are most concerned about today? On the, uh, on the adversary side, uh, it would be the, the surface-to-air uh, to defenses that, uh, that are being proliferated around the world. So, I mean, some of these things have some pretty significant capability, even against us. So, um, another thing, though, that, uh, that actually concerns us, is especially uh, in the AOR today, is, is fratricide. So is, it's being shot by, uh, by friendly forces that are also airborne coalition forces that perhaps don't know where we are. And that's one of the, the unique challenges that we deal, to, deal with in a, in a stealth airplane, uh, particularly when we don't share information over a data link with, uh, with, with certain uh, coalition partners. So um, it, it can happen, and it's definitely something that we're worried about. Sir. Thank you. Uh, the F-16 was built in vast numbers. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the Raptor, there was only 193 built. I'm very curious as to, to if you know the factors that led to that few being built. Well, I can't speak to all the factors, and, uh, but what I can say is this airplane does so much more than what we can do. So, again, a single Raptor can do you know, what a flight of four can do or a flight of eight can do, you know, it, it's just, like you said, it's a force multiplier in, in the capability of the aircraft. Now, obviously, the aircraft can't be at all places at all times, and so there are some limitations, but fortunately, we have some incredibly smart people that look at those numbers. Uh, you know, you look at stealth, you look at the technology, there's some great books out there you read about where it's gone, and, and you know, quite frankly, one of the reasons that everybody's not running around with stealth airplanes today is because they can't afford it. So, uh, fortunately, our government can't afford it, uh, for now anyway. And, uh, but it is a numbers game, and you look at the numbers that they can, can build, and they could probably build twice as many airplanes for a, a very similar unit cost of the airplanes when you start looking at some of the data. Uh, but it's really, um, you know, these, we do have smart people that are looking for the next, you know, decade, two decades, three decades ahead of what our, uh, the threats will face and the airplanes that we'll have. And uh, again, we'll have enough legacy airplanes, and we say legacy, which is the fourth generation, which is kind of sad. The F-16 is now kind of a, a legacy airplane. And again, uh, they're shooting down F-16s, by the way, now. They're drones, so now you start seeing the, uh, the orange painted F-16s. That's what we go down and shoot at for a missile shoot. So it kind of just shows you that uh, even that airplane is pretty much dated at this point. But, uh, but once um, you get to day three, day four, day five of the war. Once these uh, SAM systems that are so capable have been taken out by the, uh, the aircraft and the uh, other systems that we have available to take those out, then we can bring in the, uh, the other fighters and things like the A-10, you know. And again, it's uh, uh, like he's saying, if there's guys on the ground and there's an A-10 overhead, uh, those guys know that they, you know, they're, they're protected, but uh, they won't be there anywhere near the front of the war until uh, these guys do their work. Sir. Uh, how fast can this uh, bird fly compared to the uh, F-16 and, and F-35? And, and uh, what's your range on just internal tankage? So this is a Mach 2 airplane. And, um, you know, before, like I mentioned, I flew the F-15C, which I believe in the day it was advertised to do 2.5. And I think if you were going to do that, that was pretty much all the gas that you had in the airplane. Uh, we have the ability because of the, the slick design, all the missiles being carried internally, when the jet is clean uh, with its really big motors, it can get up and go. So we routinely operate at uh, supersonic speeds, 1.2, 1.5, um, and without a, a huge hit on fuel. And uh, as far as overall range, we flew from uh, Langley Air Force Base here 700 miles, and we had gas to do a few patterns. If, if we really wanted to stretch it out, we can do a, a, about 1,000 miles. And, uh, of course, air-to-air -air refueling is a force multiplier for everybody. So airplanes are, especially fighter airplanes, are designed with, uh, with some compromises. The more gas you hold, the less maneuverable you are based on the weight. So um, it seems like 
pretty much around the world now with jet fighters. You can fly them for about two hours before you need to go back to the tanker, with the exception of maybe the A-10 that has uh, a little bit longer duration based on the, uh, the engines that it has on it. So, Sir, I'll take the uh, F-22 demo guy for 200. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, a uh, two-fold question, can you take us on kind of a virtual walk around of the plane and explain just a couple of gee whiz type things, and then number two, maybe describe a little bit of what we'll see later on in the demo as far as things to look for and maybe how uh, different aspects of the airplane are applied to that. Sure, so uh, nose to tail from you're on the good side with a gun, um, the, uh, the jet has a radar up in the nose, uh, along with a lot of other sensors. As you look at the airplane, you can see that it's very clean. There's not a lot sticking out of it. Antennas, everything like that, it's all embedded in the airplane. And there's a variety of different sensors uh, all around it. Um, the, uh, you can see all the shapes if you were looking at the airplane. You think about how, what makes a stealth airplane stealthy. Well, there's, there's the size of it, obviously. If, you were, if we were to have a tennis ball, that would obviously have a, a smaller radar signature than a basketball. Um, but uh, then you've got the coatings on the airplane, the radar absorbent material that's, that's, uh, that's all over it. So, um, so the size, the shape, and the coatings. And if you were to take a tennis ball, like I alluded to, throw it at the airplane, there's very few places that you could go and do that, and you could actually get that tennis ball back. So um, getting down, uh, obviously, the, uh, you can see the side weapons bay doors are open there. You can see where the, uh, that would be our air-to-air -air, uh, missiles are going only in there. Underneath in the main weapons bay, you can carry in missiles or, uh, or bombs. And then uh, as you get back to the wings, uh, like I mentioned before, very large, efficient flight controls, leading edge uh, flaps on the wings, as well as trailing edge ailerons, flaperons, uh, that all move together depending on uh, what the flight controls want to do. The giant uh, tails on the back that, uh, that give the airplane the stability on the vertical tails, as well as the horizontal tails, those are all moving. In fact, our uh, vertical tails are larger than the wings on the, uh, the F-16, for example, but it is a big airplane, so it, it needs those as well. And then finally, on the way back, you can see the thrust vectoring uh, nozzles on the back because the engines are shut down. They're in their full open position, so 24 degrees up or down. And uh, uh, despite that large range of movement, I very rarely, even in some of the really high alpha maneuvering, uh, do you see them move more than five or 10 degrees because the airplane is unstable. It's, the CG is, is fairly far aft, and so the, the flight controls keep it flying. Uh, and, and with that, uh, instability gives it uh, its superior maneuverability. So um, it's always the, uh, the computers that are, that are flying it to keep it, uh, keep it from departing control flight. And the demo tomorrow, how much of this will we see in your demo tomorrow? Yeah, we're actually flying the, the, uh, this evening, and uh, around 5.30, I think, or 5.38 is our specific takeoff time. Uh, unfortunately, because of Oshkosh's uh, of small aerobatic uh, airspace, we can't do the full demonstration. So there's a couple high alpha maneuvers uh, that, that can't be accomplished in the, uh, because we don't have a Category 1 aerobatic box. Um, but what we will do is what looks normally like our, our flat show or our low show. Uh, we'll be able to show you a little bit more of the vertical on either end of the aerobatic box. And then uh, ultimately at the end of that performance, then we'll do a heritage flight. So we have a P-51 and a P-38, and we'll do a series of passes to, uh, to showcase air power past and present. And that's uh, my favorite part of the show. You get to fly. These guys fly warbirds, but I get to fly alongside of them, so that's pretty cool. Cool. Dan? question was answered. Someone asked me when was it going to fly, so that was it. That you want me to take some more questions? Uh, no, I think we're good. Okay. Uh, one last question for me. What's your call sign, John? I go by Taboo. You want to share anything about that? Yeah, if, uh, it would, if I could uh, share it with this audience, then it wouldn't be Taboo. So how about that? Okay. <laughs> Ray, what's your call sign? Uh, mine is Hollywood. Whoa. Want to share about how you got that? Absolutely not. That's what I thought. What about uh, you? <laughs> I will say that your naming is one of the worst days of your entire life, and uh, and it's uh, no for me same way. It was uh, it's not something I want to talk about. <laughs> Jim, how many call signs did you have? Did you have to get a new one every new squadron? Uh, no, sir. It kind of stayed with me. It actually occurred uh, when I started Navy flight training, and a bunch of student naval aviators were all sitting around and. One of the guys looks at me and said, well, Jim, what's your, what's your last name? And I said, Lawrence. And one of the guys said, oh, like Lawrence of Arabia. And I said, yeah, he's supposed to be in my family tree somewhere. And one of the guys said, well, you're just a nomad. And there it was. We got it. John, Ray, Jim, Mike, thank you, gentlemen, very much.